Welcome back to Your 1230, the only podcast where our guests tell their story with the help of 12 questions in just 30 minutes. Today, we are very excited to be speaking with Brian Gorman. Coming of age during the civil rights movement, then attending college as anti-Vietnam war protests grew from whispers to claim a national voice, it is not surprising that change took root in Brian Gorman early and has and has never let go. For decades, he's been engaged with change at the individual, organizational, and social levels. Today, Brian works as a certified professional coach. Through his business, TransformingLives.coach, he serves clients who are facing major personal and professional transitions in their life. He is an International Coach Federation, ICF, certified professional coach, a member of ICF New York City, and a member of the Gay Coaches Alliance. Transforming Lives Da Coach is a certified LGBT business enterprise. Much of Brian's work today focuses on helping business owners and leaders adapt to the transformational shifts in the workplace, the workforce, and the very nature of work. Brian, welcome. We are thrilled to be speaking with you. Mike, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Good to hear. Good to hear. Uh, there's a lot of good things in that very well-written bio, uh, but Specifically, I want to start with when you meet someone new or when you are talking to somebody, or perhaps a potential client, how do you explain to them what you do or where your expertise lies? The mistake that so many people make is make that introduction about themselves. My life is about helping people find greater purpose and greater fulfillment. And so when I introduce myself, I really do so in terms of surfacing that value. So for example, it might be, Mike, you were telling me that you feel unhappy in what you're doing. I help people find their happiness. So I make it about the person I'm meeting. I I love that answer because that's a question I like to start the interviews with. And that's the most I don't want to say thoughtful, but that's the most, uh, it's the answer that gives the most thought into who you're speaking to, as opposed to here, here I am, here's my standard one, two, three lines. I'm not saying it's it's better or different. It's just that you have got an approach that uh, puts a real value on understanding who you're speaking to, listening to where they are in their life, where they may be going and how you can kind of fit in that journey. So absolutely, uh, I love that. Um, so I want to dig into that in a second, but a couple other things in bio that stood out. The Personal and professional transitions. So those can be you know, large, large transitions. They can be many different things. How, and you've got cert- the certification, certainly, but how do you prepare yourself for uh, that kind of wide range of work? Two things immediately come to mind with that question. The first is Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. And Campbell said, while we approach each change as if it's unique and unpredictable, it's not. We take the same journey over and over and over again. I've spent my lifetime really coming to understand that journey, uh, what that path is, what kinds of obstacles people may face. And it really doesn't matter whether it's a professional transition or personal transition. There's a point, for example, where I'm going to start to resist. So that's the first thing. The second thing is curiosity. I don't have answers for my clients. I have a lot of experience and I help them find their answers through my curiosity. I want to follow up there. The the standard thing that we've heard for many years is, well, if someone asks you a question instead of guessing, say you'll you'll get back to them, which, you know, is is a fine approach. But where you mention your curiosity, you're you're most likely asking them questions, informed questions based on your experience. What kind of responses are you getting from some clients or, hey, you're the professional here. You're supposed to be helping me. Why are you turning this back on me? If you get that at all, and I'm sure you you can you handle that conversation well, but what, what does that look like when, when there might be a little frustration? Like, why are you asking me these questions? When I have my first conversation with a prospective client, the first thing is I say is there are two things you need to know. Our conversations belong to you, not me. You can do anything you want with them. I am held in strictest confidence, unless you're talking about illegal activities or harm to yourself or others. 
The second thing is I bring a lot of experience. I don't bring your answers. My role here is to help guide you as you find them. Very nice. Uh, the other thing in the bio that I wanted to make sure I float up on was that the last line, the uh, transformational shifts in the workplace, within the workforce, and in the nature of work. So that is very obviously uh, profession and professional driven, but it's a, that's a that's a very large topic as well. Will you see people, for the most part, when there are professional transitions, are they changing industries? Are they looking to get ahead of what they're doing? Are they confused as to where to go? What I'm sure it's a combination of all those things, but what do you see most often and how how can you help uh, help them kind of get to where they want to go. Until you clarified that, my answer was yes. <laughs> I see I call, all I of it. I caught myself. <laughs> I see all of it. Uh, today, I think the thing that I see most is how do I deal with sort of this roller coaster that we got on with COVID? You know, my boss is telling me I have to come back into the office and I don't want to. I was performing extremely well from home. And I was able to blend my work with the rest of my life. And now I'm supposed to separate them again. And um, so I think that's really the biggest issue or um, my boss is, wants me to come back to the office, but I've found out I really don't like my job or I don't like my career. So it, it really is all of those things. If we look at the factors behind the great resignation all of those things are surfacing in, in the work that I'm doing with clients these days. And we've, you know, from the headlines to just following the market in general, there seems to be, if you're just following headlines, that the, there has been a shift that as people are being asked to go to offices and as as work environments have changed, that it's not as in the great re resignation that people... Uh, in the workforce are are moving as freely or have as many options as they had. And, you know, certain industries, that's true more than others. And we don't have to get into that part. Um, but are are you seeing that uh, employees are still have as much uh, autonomy as they did 12 to 18 months ago where they can say, you know, I've had a lot of time to think about this. This is not the right environment for me. My services are more valued or I'm more interested somewhere else. Or is that tightening in, in, your, in what you're seeing? I think there are a couple of pieces to that. First of all, the um, it's important that the best people, most skilled, most able to make change, always have opportunity. And so if their organization is not being responsive to them, they're on the market. More broadly, I think people still are seeing that they do have options. The options might not be as easily visible. They might not be as many, um, but I haven't really heard anyone say, help me figure out how to hang in there another year. Okay. I like that answer. And you started with talking about the best people within an industry. And my mind immediately went to being in New York, that that was the... The cliche was, you know, if you can make New York, you can make it anywhere. And so some of the most talented, hardest working, most successful professionals are. Do you see a lot of your client base in person in the city? Um, uh, I'm sure there's been a, a shift to a virtual in in all fields, but in, in ours up more particular. And has it opened up the ability to see clients that you'll never run into uh, in the streets of New York? Well, a couple of things. First, my understanding, if I remember the numbers correctly, is about 40% of the New York office space is vacant. So there are less people in the office in New York. But in fact, I started my coach training um, in a seven-day on-site uh, program, and our instructor brought other coaches in via Zoom. So back maybe uh, 2016, I was learning how to coach on Zoom. And I have clients that have worked with me for three or four years in all parts of the world that I've never met. I don't do a whole lot of person-to-person, in-person coaching. 
I wrote down three things quickly because I need to interject. First, the 40% is incredible. And I reminded of, I had a uh, conversation with uh, somebody who handles a lot of office space in New York and Boston. And I heard those numbers and say, there's going to be a lot of corporate fallout from, from, from this because of that, that space. And his answer was, I, I think you're severely underestimating the, uh, the amount of support that a lot of our corporations have to remain you know, open businesses because that office space is open. And still 40%, that's quite a large number. Um, and, and the second thing that you mentioned, coaching on Zoom in 2016 is just a, a fortuitous turn for for where we, we've gone. Uh, and even and even then, um, not even ten years ago, I, I think Zoom would not have been a thing that most people would have heard heard of before. So, kind of having that opportunity, I'm sure it has has uh, paid dividends. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you from the bio that uh, is a central point that I do not want to overlook: uh, being part of the Gay Coaches Alliance, uh, being in New York, a, a progressive minded, a forward thinking area. How has how does that come into play to you, to who you work with, to how, again, you, your introduction is based on your audience, which I love. Uh, how, how does that come into play? Are, are people seeking you out because of um, your background, who you cater to, or what does that look like? So I cater to anyone who is looking to make a big change in their life. In some cases, that is a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, I think one of the most significant transformations that any of my clients has made was a man who came to me at the age of 74, said, I've been married for 49 years. It's time to start living who I am. I need to figure out how to come out of the closet. That's at any age. That's sad and heartbreaking news that uh, you've not been able to live the life that you wanted to. But seventy four and fifty years of marriage. That's um, it, it's a victory to to get there, but it's it's a long time to wait. Um, if if I can say something about that, I'm, and I absolutely agree with you, and it really highlights one of the th things that people tend to forget about change. There is sadness. There is letting go of something that meant something to you, no matter what the change. You know, I'm not leaving this job because I never wanted to do it. I'm leaving it because it's not right now. And so there's a letting go that has to happen. I think that that's, that's a great point because often when we talk about change, it's something that we look back in the rear view and we either gloss over how difficult, how sad, how hard, how whatever um, you know, adjective you want to put in there. Um, that, that's a good point that in the moment that it is something that we probably don't want to do. Otherwise we would have already been on that path or um, it's something that we've been putting off. So that, that sadness or that difficulty is a, kind of a big deal. So seeing that transition, transformation and moving forward in a new or different path is central to what you do. Is there any, for anybody listening who may not have the benefit of working with you, anything they can start to do to make positive change or something, a goal or a target they've been putting off because it's seemed too big or too difficult or it would cause strife in their life? What would be a good first step? Find the aspiration behind that goal. Goals are intellectual. You know, I setting a goal to lose 20 pounds this year. That's that's up in my head. The aspiration is to live a healthier life. That's a head, heart, gut aspiration. Connect with that aspiration. And the goal won't necessarily be easy, but it will be easier and more attainable. That's good advice. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, before we hit record tonight, you mentioned that you were in the beginning stages of working on a book. Uh, where are you on that? And what what is that book going to entail? The book is about leadership in the 21st century, about enlightened leadership. The workforce has changed. The workforce was changing long before COVID hit. We all heard complaints about those millennials who kept on changing employers and had no loyalty. 
Well, it had nothing to do with loyalty. It had to do with what so many workers are now saying. There was no purpose in the work they were doing. They couldn't connect their work with a greater purpose. Um, so we're seeing a, a lot of change in, in the, the workforce. We're seeing a change in the workplace, whether it be uh, work from anywhere now or hybrid, uh, whether it be uh, the four-day work week. We're seeing change in customer and and uh, people within the organization. I really try not to use the word employee um, because they are people. Um, we're seeing changes in, in that relationship. So all of that is calling for a different style of, le of leadership. It's calling for a leader who is not a top-down. It is not a micromanager but is one who coaches and grows their employees, their people who work for them. It's um, a, a leader who helps people, sets them up for success, and then gets out of the way and keeps the road clear ahead of them. It's a different kind of leadership. And so the book is really about how the workplace has changed, how the wor workforce has changed, and what that calls for in terms of changes in leadership. I have <clears throat> pieces of all of it written, and I'm now starting to weave it together. Very nice. So when you mentioned enlightened leadership, uh, thinking of a either a manager, a leader, somebody who holds that title, um, but you talk about micromanagement, you talk about not... Uh, the type of leader that we're going to see going forward are the traits that they're going to need to become successful. Is that something that can be learned through repetition, through books, through training, through study, or is that, is it more of a, a mindset and more of a way that to do your job and kind of understanding that that top-down approach never really worked all that well and no longer is going to be effective. It worked well enough a hundred years ago. Okay. <laughs> It has to begin with a change in mindset. You can't fake it. You know, if you're that authoritarian manager who's always looking over my shoulder, it's going to be very hard for you to stop doing that, first of all. And even if you do, I know that you're going to be looking at me in much the same way. So it begins with a change in mindset. And if you begin to think of yourself as someone who is there to serve your team, to support the people who work for you so that they can be successful, if you begin to think about the fact that even if you are literally the smartest person in the room, the collective of the room is smarter, uh, you change those mindsets, the, the behaviors will follow. I like that collective of the room is even if you are this, which is very rare, but you know, can't, it can't have, somebody has to be by somebody default has to be. that the collective of the room. That's nice. I'm going to, I'm going to steal that from you. So I'm telling you that. Now. Good. Uh, but, good. Uh, so you mentioned training in 2016. Uh, I'm sure you've been doing what you do for longer than since 2016. How did you get started coaching others or find that this was your calling? I guess uh, in one way, I started when I got drafted out of grad school and ended up as a drill sergeant in the Air Force. My whole career has had one common thread, and that's people moving through change. So for many years, I was an organizational change management consultant. And one of the things I learned is it's a misnomer. Organizations don't change. People change. And so before I mentioned um, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, that's the same change journey, whether I'm coaching one person or guiding a huge organization. At some point, being a consultant, living in airports and hotels got a little bit old. And um, so for many years, I stepped back, I did writing, I developed change management training programs um, supported methodology development around organizational change. And one day my coach said, 
there's a coach training program coming up that I think you might be interested in. And it was in fact sponsored by the Gay Coaches Alliance. And uh, the first day I was there, I said, this is where I was meant to be. If you could, for, for those listening who are not intimately familiar with the difference in those roles, if you could explain the organizational change kind of consultancy role versus the coach, there is, there is some overlap, but what that main difference is besides, you know, flying out Mondays to Thursdays, <laughs> uh, why that, why that kind of clicked for you and what you saw there in that, in that first training that was like, yes, this is where I need to be. Consultants are subject matter experts. As a consultant, you're expected to have all the answers. And even if you do have the answers, if your client doesn't execute them very well and the change fails, you're the one the finger of guilt is pointed at. As a coach, as I said earlier, I don't have answers. I have questions. At the end of the day of consulting, I felt very heavy, very weighted down, and very tired. As a coach at the end of the day, I can be very tired, but I feel lifted up because my clients have had great ahas, have discovered great new things about themselves, have learned how to let go of those old tapes that may be holding them back. So it's, it's just a very different experience, a very different approach to helping people and organizations move forward. I like I like that distinction you draw because again, they're terms sometimes that get swapped out or interchanged, but they are very different roles. And the example you give at the end of the day between the two, I think that's that paints a that paints a wonderful picture. And that's that's me, Mike. I have um had a conversation and uh during a webinar with Maria Darby, who is a former um executive director of the Association of Change Management Professionals. Maria is also a coach. Her passion is consulting. It goes back to the first thing you said, understanding who's in front of you, what what they're looking to to learn, to achieve, move toward, and then how you can be uh, that that sounding board or that piece that helps them get there. Knowing that different different interests for different people, even if they have the same same like same talents, that their outputs could be different. So I like that example. Um, you mentioned having, <clears throat> and you didn't use the term limiting belief, but it's something I thought of as as you describe what holds people back uh, in, in your line of work, where you're helping people through change. One of the things that I hear frequently on the show is that people have limiting beliefs, and a lot of the time they don't even know that they're there. How can how can we, again, for our listeners, discover what things might be just constructs in our mind that are keeping us from either the the, the goals that we have, the the things that we want to accomplish, or even our, our aspirations? Uh, what's a good starting point for d- d- understanding what is limiting our, our mind or our beliefs? I call them gremlins. And you're right, we all have them. And the first thing I, I listen for what people are saying. So if I hear a gremlin, I'll call it out. So it might be, you know, I I just don't feel like I'm ready for the next step yet. Well, if you don't feel like you're ready for the next step, you're not ready for the next step. That doesn't mean that change that belief, you're not ready. But that feeling inside will hold you back. Quite literally, uh, the human mind responds to story the same as the lived event. And so if you can change the story, you can change the trajectory of your life. So once I hear a limiting belief, or if a client comes to me and says, I really need help because I'm just procrastinating on everything that's important to me will work on identifying, naming that gremlin. What do you want to replace that with? And then literally change the story. It 
Do you have a story that you could share about helping somebody kind of walk through that? Because uh, even as you say it to me, I, I feel defensive that it's that I, I would I would want to push back and say, you no, know, you know, I, I am ready or I'm not ready or you know, you, you're, I'm not explaining it well. Is, is is there a story that comes to mind where you helps me kind of really see this? Yeah, um, thinking of one client who actually it was procrastination, and she said, I procrastinate around making important decisions. And so I think she, she named it Peter procrastination and she wanted to replace Peter with Donna decision. So the first step in the process is to begin to notice because you don't sit there and say, I think it's time for Peter to come out and play. So to start notice when you're procrastinating and to just literally log that down and begin to look for patterns. And in her case, she came back and she said, you know what? I don't procrastinate all the time. I only, if the decision is about someone else in my family or a decision I have to make at work, I have no trouble making decisions. So it's not decision-making that is my problem. It's when I have to make a decision that only serves me that I procrastinate. Well, now that she sees that, when those decisions come up, she can start calling on Donna decision. And as you move, so it's not about breaking the old habit. It's not about erasing the old tape. It's about creating the new one. And over time, as the trigger comes up and she's now making a decision for herself and again and again and again, that becomes the automatic response. And the old the tape, the gremlin ends up tucked away. That's a good answer. Thank you. Um, somehow we're already coming up on time. Uh, so I will ask this last question, kind of taking a, a gear uh, or uh, changing gears, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. But you, before we hit record, you also mentioned that you've been in New York for a good amount of time. Did you have a welcome to New York City moment or were you prepared when you first first arrived? Well, I grew up uh, about eight miles out of New York uh, in New Jersey, and my mother worked for decades in New York City. She would get up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning to get in the city ahead of traffic, and if she couldn't get out of work by mid-afternoon, she'd wait until 7 or 8 at night to not get stuck in traffic. So when I moved here, I decided if I'm moving to New York City, I'm going to live in New York City. So... I think I moved in uh, December 1st of 1986. And one of the first places I had been was doing sort of the touristy stuff, the South Tree Seaport. And there I saw a coffee grinder. Well, now I'm going Christmas present shopping and I'm living up on East 96 for anyone who knows New York City. And I'm getting somebody a coffee grinder. So I have to go all the way down to South Street Seaport because that's where they sell them. Well, no, they sold them on the next block from my apartment. <laughs> so that was sort of the first big aha that I really have to get to know New York City um, a, a lot more intimately. I, I, <laughs> I enjoy that story and I laugh. As somebody who spent a few years in New York, I made a lot of similar uh, mistakes and judgment. So that's that's a good one. So thank you for sharing that. Um, where can our listeners connect with you, Brian? Where can they find out more if they would like to? My website is transforminglives.coach. They can reach out to me at brian at transforminglives.coach or find me on LinkedIn. So we will post those links. Uh, my real last question to you this evening is we've, I think we've covered a good amount of ground, but is there anything that I did not ask you that I probably should have? I think we really hit the road running. We'll take it. Well, Brian, thank you very much for joining us. This was a lot of fun and I look forward to doing it again. Thank you, Mike. Have a great day.